Ichthyosaurs were dolphin-like reptiles that lived in the oceans during the Mesozoic, the time of the dinosaurs, and many of the early ones weren't actually that dolphin-like. One example of this is Huepasuchus, which is actually a little bit more eel-like, and it was a very early one of these members. To be fair, it is an ichthyosauromorph rather than being an ichthyosaur, so it is a little bit separate, but it does help us understand a little bit about their early evolution. Huepasuchus was actually toothless though, which is something that's really unique in the ichthyosaurs. Additionally, it also was only about three feet long or around one meter, which is pretty small. The specimens of Huepasuchus that we know of have all been found basically on their side in this Lagerstadt, a place of really, really good preservation, but also it's just a little funny because there's certain biases, such as being still water, they fall down on their side a lot. So if we want to understand the top part of the skull, it's actually really hard because in general, they are flattened. So it's kind of just a little schmear on the rock. It's really hard to tell some of those three-dimensional details. Two new fossils though have been really great for helping researchers to understand how Huepasuchus probably fed. And that's because these two died, yes, but they also had their head rotated when they died, meaning the top part of the skull is what got smushed, but we can still see that top part of it at least once it was prepared out of the rock. This allowed the researchers to make a very interesting comparison of the one meter long Huepasuchus to the eight meter long minke whale. So something many times the size of Huepasuchus. But there are some really clear, obvious similarities. The first of these is the divide that goes down the middle of the skull all the way through the tip of the snout. In baleen whales, this actually helps them to open up their mouths wider so that when they're filter feeding, they can take in more water and by extension, prey. But there's also the bones colored in gray, the nasals, and they're not similarly shaped, but they are in similar positions, which is really important because the nasals being paired like this and also having their particular shape on the underside does help whales to actually open up that mouth even more again. So it is another filter feeding adaptation, and it seems like Huepasuchus may have been doing the same thing, both with those nasal bones and with the divide down the center of the skull. The basic ratios of where the different bones are throughout the skull were all mapped out with these little dots, and that's also useful because that way we can compare it to other animals. And it turns out Huepasuchus actually falls right on the border between the mysticetes and the odontocetes, which are essentially the baleen and the toothed whales respectively. So it's right there in the broader group that would be baleen whales, it's just a lot smaller. This really suggests that Huepasuchus was the first or among the first filter feeding tetrapods to actually move back into the water and adopt this lifestyle. And it's really interesting that it's here because it lived only 5 million years after the Permian Triassic extinction, or maybe even a little bit less. The Permian Triassic extinction was devastating. Up to 95% of life in the oceans died and up to 75% of life on land died. So the fact that it survived and its lineage survived at all is really interesting but also the fact that it adopted filter feeding so quickly. We have filter feeding in other tetrapods, including the baleen whales, but baleen whales only evolved filter feeding almost 30 million years after the first whales really showed up. So it took them a long time to develop that kind of feeding strategy. There's even one plesiosaur, Morturnia, which seems to have similar adaptations, but lived during the late Cretaceous. And the first plesiosaurs were evolving about the same time Huepasuchus was around. So that's a hundred million plus years before they really started doing this kind of filter feeding behavior. Again, really, really strange that this ichthyosauromorph was able to develop this strategy. It's also really strange because Huepasuchus is so small. When we think about filter feeding tetrapods today, you probably think of something like a baleen whale. They're massive. Even the small ones are pretty big. And Huepasuchus just wasn't big at all. And it's not for lack of trying, at least in the broader ichthyosauromorphs. Some of the ones that were around at this time were absolutely huge. This means that it's potentially just the environment of Huepasuchus that allowed it to make this kind of lifestyle. Because the environment that it was suggested to have been deposited in, also living around, seems like it was a pretty low activity lagoon. This would mean that there's not a lot of photosynthesizers. The water be very still and you're not gonna get a lot of sediment stirred up for nutrients. However, what you do get is gonna be some very small phytoplankton, which can start to grow, and then zooplankton eating that phytoplankton, and then finally Huepasuchus eating that zooplankton. And seemingly because it was a small lagoon, 
it wasn't necessarily under that much pressure to change its lifestyle, or get very big, because the food was limited. That's not to say it was only Huepasuchus that was alive in this area. There were also some relatives like Eretmoripus, which was almost a duck-billed platypus-like ichthyosauromorph, and probably dug around in sand and mud to try and find worms and other invertebrates to eat. But that's still very different from what we see all of the other ichthyosauromorphs doing. So it seems like this may have just been a very highly endemic region, simply because these lagoons allowed these animals to evolve very specific niches. And then once the lagoons were lost, they were kind of out of luck and died out. 